Good afternoon, this is Sean Golding with Golding and Golding. Here to go through a, a very uh, common question uh, we get about the FBAR, which is just simply what is considered a financial account and therefore reportable on the FBAR, right? Uh, the FBAR is foreign bank and financial account reporting, so it's not just limited to bank accounts. We're going to get into that in a minute. Uh, the form is filed each year. It's filed on FinCEN Form 114. FinCEN refers to the Financial Crimes Enforcement Network, but 99% of the time plus it has nothing to do with there's no criminal implication to it. Uh, since about 2013, it's an electronic form. Uh, it's due on April 15th, but it's on automatic extension. So when it comes to filing the FBAR, it's a little less complicated than some of the other forms, even the 8938, which is for FACT, the 5471, which is for foreign corporations and things like that, because essentially all you have to report is the maximum account value. If you can't get the maximum account value, you can mark off amount unknown, but there are some issues with doing that too much. So uh, that's something you should speak to with a specialist before before you take that position and just start marking off amounts unknown on multiple accounts for multiple years. When it comes to the bank and financial accounts, let's go through some of the common types of uh, financial accounts that will be necessary to be on the FBAR. So one is investment accounts such as pooled fund accounts. So let's say you have a mutual fund or an ETF, a CCOF, something similar that's reportable that type of investment account is reportable in fact even if it's not in an account if you just own the funds individually then you have to report that as well but for fbar purposes not for 8621 if you have it all in an account then you can typically just report the account number stocks are a little different if you have stock certificates they're generally not reportable on the fbar uh, there are some very minor exceptions and exclusions but for the most part it's not um, when it comes to stock accounts, like an Ameritrade or anything like that, Vanguard, Schwab, that is reportable, but you don't have to break down each specific stock. You just report the account information. Insurance policy is very common in, in many countries, especially like Singapore, uh, where you have life assurance policies in the UK, endowment policies, where, yeah, it's, it's an insurance policy, but it's essentially it's an investment wrapped in a policy so that the primary goal is... Um, is the investment and there might be a small death benefit versus a life insurance policy here in the U.S., your typical one where you're not earn, uh, excluding annual annuities, right? You're, you're not earning any income on it. Someone passes away, the beneficiaries, um, they receive some money. Those type of insurance policies with a surrender value or cash value are generally reportable as well. Foreign pension plans. Now, foreign pension plans are reportable whether you've got your um, whether you've got your superannuation fund in Australia, your Provident fund in Malaysia, or Hong Kong, or Taiwan, uh, your RRSPs and your RIFs in Canada, all reportable. Okay, Whether there's any immediate tax implication or whether there's a treaty doesn't impact whether it's reportable. There is some information online that you might find that will say something along the lines of um, pensions aren't, aren't reportable. Uh, what that meant was that if you have a U.S. IRA, let's say, and in that IRA, you have foreign accounts. Those foreign accounts are not reportable. But it doesn't mean the foreign uh, pension plans aren't reportable. They, they are reportable. Uh, a few issues to consider. Something like RRSPs and, and RIFs are very common in Canada. Uh, you used to have to make an annual election on 8891 or 8991. You don't have to do that anymore. Um, until you start receiving income, generally they're not taxable. You don't need them for Form 3520. There's a specific revenue procedure exception but you still have to report it for FBAR purposes. Um, a foreign institution in a U.S. branch. So let's say you have Citibank or some other U.S. Uh, bank in a foreign country. That's generally reportable. But, but the inverse, let's say, for example, you have, a, uh, you have a foreign bank, Santander, let's say, and they have a branch in the United States. Well, if that's where you have your account, well, then that's not going to be reportable as a foreign institution. And then virtual currency, of course, when it comes to virtual currency, if it's just a virtual currency account, it's not reportable yet, but there's a current notice, uh, FinCEN notice 2020-2, I believe, which essentially says that's what they're pushing. And if it's a hybrid account, for example, you've got some fiat, some US, uh, not, normally not USD, but you've got some euro in there and you've got your um, your crypto in there, well, then that's going to be reportable. You can't essentially take a foreign account, throw some crypto in there and say, oh, well, now the whole account's not reportable. 
If you're out of compliance for prior years before filing for the current year, there's various amnesty programs that you can use to get into compliance. If you're willful or just can't certify under penalty of perjury that you're non-willful, you would do the Voluntary Disclosure Program, uh, VDP. Uh, since 2018, September uh, 28th, I believe it's now for both offshore and domestic. If you're non-willful, there's various other options available. There are the re uh, streamlined procedures, delinquency procedures, or reasonable cause. We have lots of free information available on our main website and our sub-websites. You can always reach out and schedule a reduced fee initial consultation if you think it's appropriate to your matter, and it's something that we handle here. Um, again, my name is Sean Golding with Golding & Golding. Thank you for your time. Enjoy the rest of the day.